Hello and welcome to Cardiac Tamponade. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk about what happens in a cardiac tamponade. First of all, these are the layers of the heart. So when you look at the layers of the musculature of the heart here, what we see is that we can see the endocardium on the very inside, the myocardium, the muscular layer, the epicardium, and then the pericardial cavity, followed by the outside layers of the heart. So this is the piece we're looking at here, the pericardial cavity, where the little arrow is. There's a little cavity there, a little space that contains some fluid to help so when the muscle moves, it's not rubbing up against the outside or the pericardium. So that's what allows the heart to be able to beat and not create friction or not create any irritation. However, if we get some fluid forming in that pericardial cavity, then it can cause problems. That's what we call a cardiac tamponade. So in this case here, you can see that fluid has formed in that pericardial space and it is now pressing on, compressing the ventricle. So the ventricle now is smaller than it should be and then that is going to cause a decrease in cardiac output. So this is our main problem that occurs with cardiac tamponade is a decrease in cardiac output and that's what's going to be demonstrated by the symptoms we see which is a narrow pulse pressure, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds. Now when you look at these things, a narrow pulse pressure is true with both hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. So that could occur with either one. So this could be hypovolemic in nature, especially if you saw that the patient was having a trauma or traumatic type of event. Jugular venous distension doesn't follow with having hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, we would have flat jugular veins instead of jugular venous distension. So the narrow pulse pressure, the jugular venous distension, that leads us to think that this is cardiogenic in nature. So why isn't this just cardiogenic shock? Well, then we hear the muffled heart sounds. And the muffled heart sounds are kind of the key here that's telling us, hey, this is a cardiac tamponade. So what is the treatment for a cardiac tamponade? It's going to be a pericardial synthesis. Pericardial synthesis occurs when they stick a needle into that pericardial sac and pull out that fluid. Now, in some cases, they will put a catheter in and continue to drain the fluid over a longer period of time. This would be contraindicated if this is a traumatic type of tamponade because if blood is sitting in that pericardial sac and we pull the blood out, it could release the pressure on the bleeding vessel, which would then allow it to bleed more. So what do you need to know about a pericardial synthesis? Well, it's guided by ultrasound, and when it is, we have a 95% success rate with really no complications. When it's done blindly, then there is a 20% complication rate. So yeah, I guess you'd have to do a blind cardiocardial synthesis if you don't have ultrasound handy, but it has a much higher complication rate. When you look at those complications that can occur with pericardial synthesis, you can see why it is so important that we have ultrasound handy so that we're not causing additional injury to the pericardium or to the lungs and the surrounding tissues. Thanks for joining me for Cardiac Tamponade. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 